brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon the rock, and he established my goings. He had put a song in my heart, even praises unto my Lord. Others will see it, and they will fear, and they will trust in the Lord. That I grew up in typical inner city black America, and I was a product of that. I stuck to it. I grew up in it. I was a child unwanted. I was born in my mother's sin and her iniquity. It was so bad that when my mom bore me, I was actually born in Washington, D.C. We were from Philadelphia, but my mom had moved because of the sin that caused her to conceive me. And she was going to give me away. So I was unwanted. I was black, impoverished during the 60s and 70s when people were trying to figure out that people were people. I grew up uh, in the inner city uh, in uh, southwest Philadelphia, 111 East Minor Street. That was my address. And back, if you know anything about the cities, you claimed your street, you claimed your set, and that's how you rolled. I watched men, pimps, players, women slayers. I watched them and I saw how they lived their life and the things that they did and the manipulations. And that grew a part of me. It became who I was. It's how I lived my life. I didn't have a father. I was a bastard. I was a child, literally, whose father did not want him. But that was okay. I had all the boys in the hood that were good to me who taught me. I was a dope dealer at five years old. You see, I walked up and down the streets going to get milk at the corner store, and I used to drop off packages. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew it's how I made money. And then my family decided to move, and I'm going to jump way ahead, and we, we moved out here to New Mexico. Wait, let me digress. You see, in that time in the city where my mom thought that everything was okay, she had friends. You see, my mom was young when she conceived me. She had friends that... She entrusted us with two men who molested me and my brothers from the age of three to the age of eight, who put me in front of their little sister and told me to touch her here and touch her there, and I became sexually perverse between three and eight. And from eight to 13, before I moved out to New Mexico, my aunts, some of my older cousins, I was defiled, I, I, I was twisted, I was angry, I was hurt. You see... I knew it was wrong, but it felt good. I knew it was no good, but I continued to do it because they paid me. Two men. I was confused. Did I like men? Was it okay for me to be with men? So I was angry. So now I'm a teenager with twisted thoughts and twisted views of how to deal with women and how to deal with life. So I came out to New Mexico and our father left us. My mother with five kids, no job. See, he was in and out. He was suffering and going through issues of his own. And he wasn't even my father. He was the man that decided to come along for the ride or take us along for the ride. Again, my anger grew and I became a stick up kid, a hustler, a player. I became all these things. See, my older brother became our disciplinarian and I became our provider. See, and at 13 and 14, you can get little jobs, but I knew what the streets taught me, how to break into people's houses, how to steal, how to hustle, how to deal. And so I did those things. I lived a duplicitous life. You see, in that pit, that pit grew in me, and I became pitiful. So you got to understand, God was doing something. Even then, I didn't know who God was. I didn't know about God. See, I was brought up also in a twisted religion where Jesus was just the son or considered an angel and God was God and he really didn't have time for us or he would have never brought us out to New Mexico, leave us, abandon us, make us homeless, poor, live in shelters and all these things, the typical things of a ghetto kid's life. I was a victim of all of them. And then one day I decided to become a drug dealer. I decided to try drugs and do drugs and sell drugs and push drugs, and I ended up in prison. This is 
when I went to prison for a long time. See, I'm not telling you the stories of all the other times that I was arrested, incarcerated, held for questioning. But I ended up in prison, and there I learned about the Bible. I started to read the Bible, go through the Bible, and read everything about God that I could. But not because I wanted to serve God or live for God, but I figured that if God was God and did what God said, that he might help me get through prison. So I used God, like a lot of us do. We call on him when we're in need, but I didn't even belong to him, but since God loved me. See, he wrote a scripture that he so loved the world. I was part of that world that he loved that had not accepted or received him yet. And so I denied him, and I, I, but I grew in knowledge. I read the Bible probably about 20, 30 times, and then the day came, and they said, you're about to get out of prison. And I said, okay. So I went up to my room, and I cried, and I told God, I will not serve you anymore. I can't do it. I don't want to live the life that you have for me. You see, I'm still interested in women drugs, alcohol, and all those things that entice me, all those things that satisfied and pleased my flesh. So I got out of prison and continued the lifestyle. And at that time, I met a woman in 2000, and she belonged to God. And I used to talk to this lady. My first date with her, I spent two and a half hours talking about God with her. I didn't know that God was in me that much, but I knew God was in her. And so she scared me, so I ran from her. For four years, I ran from her. <laughs> Amen. And then one day, I came to her, and we got together. And she told me, after she married me, that if I didn't give my life to God, she would stay my wife, but we couldn't walk together. And I had to take a real hard look at myself. You see, this woman had seen the evil in me the dirt in me, but she saw something else. Actually, she heard from God. I didn't hear it, and I didn't know it, but I wanted whatever it was. See, I didn't want to see my life without her, so I made a decision that I would go to Houston to find out who this God was, to find out what this God had for me, to prove that he didn't care about a ghetto kid like me. You see... I could call on him, and he could watch over me, and he could do all these things for me, but I wasn't his. So I went out to Houston, told her I'd be gone for one or two months. I wound up being out there for nine months. Needless to say, God got a hold of me, transformed my life, and started to work in me and change in me, and, and I became saved. But that was only the beginning. You see, salvation was only the beginning because when I came back to Albuquerque, I had to go to uh, El Paso, and I wound up being out there nine months in ministry, and I thought I had this God thing down, right? I thought I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and it's okay. But God goes, no, 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 that's just the beginning. You see, you have to grow in faith, knowledge, understanding, godliness, brotherly love, brotherly kindness, all these things. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. And God goes, you don't have to. I'll do it through you, and I'll do it for you. And so what he did is he started to transform my life. And in that transformation, he started to show me things that I hadn't dealt with yet. See, I thought drugs and alcohol were my problem. He said, no, integrity and character are your problem. And he goes, when we get to those, we have to get to some other issues. You know that sexual perversion that you're a part of? He goes, you need to deal with that. So he took me to a class with Mary to find out what it meant to be a post-aborted father. You see, in my sexual immorality I had impregnated five different women and whether by omission or commission I had nothing to say when they had an abortion with my child but I didn't know that was an issue or a problem for me until God introduced it to me and I said wait a minute God what took you so long I've been with you for a few years and now you're drawing this up God said I got to get the pit up out of you that I brought you up out of amen and that's what he did. He, he, he started to reveal and pull things out of me. He started to show me the evil that was in me. You see, sanctification is a process. Salvation is instant. But sanctification became this process that I'm going through right now. Amen. See, me being here is still part of the process. And God started to reveal this immorality in me and said, this is your thorn in your side. You see, you thought it was drugs and alcohol and all these other things. Since you were three, Satan has been messing with you. 
And I go, well, why did you wait, God? He said, I didn't wait. My timing is perfect. He goes, I know who you are, and I know who you are in me. And so you want this impoverished black kid from the ghetto. You aren't an ex-con, criminal, a womanizing, lying, double-minded, hypocritical man. You are who I say you are, and I am the great I am. And he said, Aaron, you are redeemed. I am redeemed. I am restored. I am renewed. I am re reconciled. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, in that new creation, he said, I, I was born again as a child. And today I, I stand before you seven years old in Jesus. Seven years old, so I'm still a child. And I have to learn to receive my inheritance. You see, I am a son of God. I am an heir to the throne. And see, God said, everything that I have is yours. He goes, but I need to teach you how to deal with it. And he teaches me as he walks me through my life. As he reveals in me the sin that still oppresses me because it is not in me. Because he brought it out. He said, he, he did something in me. Uh, there's a song uh, by Eminem that he says, I am whatever you say I am. I am whatever God says I am. If I wasn't, why would God say I am? Yeah. Amen? See, God is not one that he should lie. He's not a respecter of person. What he did for me, he wants to do for somebody else. He wants to do to that person that is enslaved by that sin or in bondage to that thought that they are less than. You see, God has taught me that I am wonderfully and fearfully made. God had started to do a process in me because the world had told me lies. My mother, unbeknownst to her, lied to me. My family lied to me. The color of my skin lied to me. My circumstances lied to me. My situation, my economicals, all lied. You see, before I am a man, I am a Christian. Before I'm an African a man, African American, I am a Christian. Before I'm a husband, I am a Christian. Before I'm a father, I am a Christian. Before I'm a son, I am a Christian. I am part of the great I am. And I'm here to testify to the goodness, the wonderful love and mercy of grace that God renews in me every day. You see, this battle wages on because one thing that God said I also am, I am a soldier in the army of the Lord, here to fight in his name and his honor and his glory. He did that for me. You see, life told me that I had no purpose. Life told me that I was going to grow up to be this or that, and I was going to make this or that money. Life lied to me. See, God told me that I'm heir to a kingdom in heaven. And that he went and prepared a place for me that when I get done fighting, when I get done testifying, and when he gets done sanctifying, he's going to bring me home. But I must go until he comes. I must preach till he stops me. I am his child. You see, he pulled me up out of a horrible pit, out of the muck and the mire. And he established me on a rock. And he established my goings, and he placed a song in my heart. Others will hear it, they will see it, and they will fear, but they will come to trust in the Lord thy God. Amen. Thank you.